get up, God, and just uh, be in this day. Father, I pray uh, for the service. God, I pray for Michael as he comes and speaks. God, that you would just speak through him. God, that we could see these songs for what they are, and that we could say glory in the highest and see you for that and how beautiful you are. And Father, I just pray for everyone here. God, I know that this time of year is fun and festive. But, Father, it might be hard for some people. And, Father, I pray that they could see this season for what it is 
not about presents, not about Christmas trees, not about any of that materialistic stuff. God, that we could see the birth of you and the start of something so perfect and so awesome and so loving. And that we could see that through this message. God, we just love you so much and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. What is most important? What's most important for God's universal church as a whole? What's most important for us here at Freedom? And what's most important for us individually? If I haven't met you yet, uh, my name is Michael Fear. Uh, I'm not on staff, but I lead our young adults here at Freedom Bible Church. That's the, the 18 to 30 year old age group. And recently had a son, or I guess not recently now, it's been about eight months, but he, because of him, my wife is staying home to, to, to raise him, and you know, if you guys have done that, you know that, you know that if there's, it's a little bit tight around the house. You don't have that extra money you once had, you know, and things get tighter. So what I wanted to do is, you know, try to find a way to make extra money. So the thing that I did is I decided I'm going to start going to yard sales, and I'm going to try to find something that somebody's selling for five bucks that I can sell on eBay for 50. And I got to tell you this, for some of you guys, you're like, that does not sound appealing at all. That sounds like a complete waste of time. But I got to be honest, I absolutely love it. And I've been thinking back through my life, all the way back to when I was a kid growing up with sports, and I'll be honest, I don't know if I found a hobby ever, and I'm 30, I don't know if I've found a hobby in 30 years that I like more than this. And, and I, I kind of take it serious, so I even hesitate to use the word hobby. But it's a rush. And I, you know, my wife will tell you, when I find something I like, I get obsessive about stuff. I'm the guy that, that will pull up all the YouTube videos of guys that do this full time and figure out what they're buying, what their strategies are, how they sell it. But here's the problem when you're like that. You know, Me personally, like, I, I found out the last couple months because I found something that I love spending so much time on that uh, I get a little distracted, and I, and I lose a little bit, fo little bit of focus when I find something like that. And I found myself not thinking of the things of God enough and thinking of yard sales. <laughs> and it's Christmas season. The reality is I'm probably not the only person in this room that feels the same way. Whether it's you're, you're trying to find the right gifts for everybody, whether you're uh, preparing for family to come in town the next couple days, or whether you're, you've just, you feel like you lost focus of God. These verses that we're going to study today, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, are, are verses I've had in my head for probably three months. And I thought, I actually was going to use these verses at our, we do a young adult conference every year. It's going to be in February this year. And I was going to do these verses then. I still may. We'll see. But I thought they fit perfectly today. Part of me wonders if these verses have been in my head for so long because God in his sovereign plan knew that I was going to find something that I was going to love, that I was going to spend a lot of time on. So we'll go through that today. And I think Paul, God, through the writing of Paul, is going to remind us what's most important uh, for the church as a whole, America and the entire world, what's most important for freedom, and, and what's most important for each one of us. So we'll go over that. And before we get to the verses, though, the author of 1 Corinthians is Paul. And if you don't know who Paul is, before he was a Christian, he was a religious fanatic, literally worked to systematically kill Christians, to systematically kill them. Didn't just hate them, would kill them. The Bible says after Stephen gave an incredible message, it says Paul approved of the execution of Stephen. Paul was such a living terror. Here's what the disciples thought when they heard that he had become a Christian, he had become a disciple of Jesus. Look at this. It's in uh, Acts 9. And when Paul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe him. They didn't believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Paul was such a crazy 
terrorist that was killing Christians, they didn't even believe that he was a changed man. Paul became the greatest missionary of all time, proof that God can save anybody. Here's the reality of that. If this is your first time in church and you feel like God can't, God can't save me, he doesn't know what I've done, have you been systematically killing Christians? The answer is no, or you wouldn't be in this building today. Paul, or God can save anyone. Paul goes on to spend a year and a half uh, in Corinth, starts the Corinthian church. After he leaves, things kind of go crazy. So Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church, which is 1 Corinthians, what we're getting ready to study. But to truly understand, we're in, we're in 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, if you've got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 15, to truly understand maybe some of the significance of chapter 15, we have to know what the first 14 chapters were about. Again, the chapters weren't there when Paul read it, wrote it. it. They were added afterwards to help us categorize it. But we have to understand what the beginning of his letter said to understand the significance. So I thought, you know, what better way to understand the first 14 chapters than we should just read the first 14 chapters. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we should just read the first 14 chapters. But let me summarize them for you. Chapters 1 through 3 are about unity. They're about our ability to understand the fact, that, the fact that we understand who Jesus Christ is comes from God. It's not an earthly wisdom. It's a heavenly wisdom. Chapters 4 through 6 are about serving with a humble heart, how to handle disputes, and the seriousness of sexual sin. Chapters 7 through 10 are about marriage, food sacrifices, total surrender. Chapter 11, chapters 11 through 14, some of the most debated chapters in the entire Bible, are about head coverings, spiritual gifts, communion, and tongues. So now that we know that, let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Paul's talked about all those things, and here's what he says. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised in the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. Let's go on. Then it says, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, talking about the resurrected Jesus, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to his half-brother James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, Paul says, he appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. What did, God, what did Paul preach? The gospel. So we're going to talk a lot about today. What is the gospel? It simply means good news. If you're new to this, the gospel simply means good news. Why do we have to have good news is because there's bad news. The bad news is, is that we are in a fallen, sinful world. We're imperfect. We have a sin nature. We, we rebel against the things of God. And because of that, we cannot be in the presence of a perfect, holy, righteous, just God. But God, in his mercy and in his love, came down, took, the, took our place, went to the cross, raised three days later. And because of that, we can trust that we can spend eternity in the presence of God. That's the good news, that we can't do it, but God did it for us. And I think, I think sometimes we see the gospel as a a beginner level topic. Like, this is what the rookies in church do. They, they, they talk about the gospel. You know, the, the, the varsity Christians, they're, they're, they're studying revelation. They're studying the, the deep theology. Well, the gospel is the most important theology, and it is deep theology that we must understand. Who cares if you have revelation memorized if you get the gospel wrong? It is the most important thing. And, you know, I... I've said this before, but I think for me, a while back, I, you know, I, I saw the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus Christ as a one-time thing, something that just happened like for conversion. Once, 
you, know, you, you need Jesus to get saved, and then after that, you, you're just a little unsure what's the significance there. So if there's one thing I want us to take away from this message, it, it, it's for us to see the gospel and Jesus as bigger than it is, some, as, as bigger than ever. Not as just some figure for a holiday, but as a real person who is not dead, who is still living, and who reigns over the world. Let's, let's take a close look at 15, 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and that he was raised, and on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. In accordance with the scriptures, talking about the Old Testament prophecies pointing to Jesus. In these verses, we see the gospel is not just something for conversion. It is the most important thing, Paul says. And, and you know, one thing to note, verse uh, th three, it says, What I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures. Our culture is trying to give Jesus a makeover. But we have to understand the reality of the importance of how God feels about sin. He felt so strongly he had to send his son here to take, take the punishment for us. But one thing I wanted to add is, you know, the idea of repentance, us turning from sin and turning towards Jesus the word repent, and I've told our young adults this recently, the word repent has kind of a negative stigma attached to it, and that's mainly because it's been hijacked by people on street corners with signs. But the reality is, is that the word repentance is a good thing. It's a word we should celebrate. It's us turning, turning away from the world and turning towards Jesus. Let's not shy away from the word repent. It's when we tell people to repent, it's done in love. It's done in kindness, the way God looked at us. Paul says, let me remind you, brothers, of the gospel that saved you. He's saying, this isn't new. You've, you heard this. You believed it. You trusted in it. You were saved by it, and you can stand confidently in it. How could you possibly lose your salvation if you couldn't earn it in the first place? It doesn't make sense. You can't lose something you can't earn. Corinth was a crazy town. This is, this is why I wanted to summarize the first 14 chapters. Corinth was a crazy town. The, the phrase Corinthianize became a slang term to represent um, immorality, drunk, drunkenness, drunken debauchery. The word Corinthianize became a slang term for those things. It was so crazy. And you saw the first 14 chapters Paul was talking about. Unity, he was talking about sexual sin, all this stuff. But I want you to point out, after he says all of that, Here's what he says is most important, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised, and on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He's saying, even if you get all of those things right in the first 14 chapters, but you don't get this right, you're wrong. You have to get this right. This is going to transform your heart. That's going to transform everything, else, everything previously. This is the most important thing. So I think three things happen. When we understand the gospel, Jesus is of first importance. I think the first one is we realize we aren't saved because of good morals. If, if you've been around church for a while, that's going to seem like an obvious one to you. But I promise you, at all of your family gatherings this, this week, if you were to ask people around the table why they think they're going to be in heaven, a lot of those answers are going to be revolved around good morals and being a good person. It's been my reality of talking to people that's what they think saves them. And it's, I, to be honest, I think this is our greatest challenge as Christians in America is dealing with morality. Not, not to fix morality, but the fact that we're not saved by good morals. This is, this is, I know for a fact people have been mind blown by this. So I think there are a couple issues with that type of thinking. There are a couple issues with the fact that we think we're, we're saved, we're Christians because of good morals. The first one is, it's, just, it's not what the Bible says. Romans 3, 10 through 11, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, 
Paul says, and he references the Old Testament. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands, and no one seeks for God. No one is righteous, not one. I, th- I think the second, the second thing that, that, um, that when I look towards the idea that we're saved because of good morals, it, what is the scale for that? What, what, how do we judge that I'm a good person, I'm going to be in heaven? Like, who, who, where's that scale come from? What type of scale is it? Is it like, you know, for example, let's just say this, this stage is a scale for goodness, all right? How do we judge who is good and who isn't? I think we would probably all agree that if this is the good side and this is the bad side of goodness, Hitler's probably on this side, and he's probably far down there. You know, I'm no history buff, but I think we would probably all agree that Mother Teresa is probably on this side. Billy Graham is probably on the good side. If, If you liked my message today so far, maybe you think I'm on the good side. If you haven't liked it so far, maybe you think I'm on this side. Here's another one. Please, nobody tell me what side you think this is. If you like our current president, you probably think he's on this side. But half the country thinks he's on this side. How do we judge this? How do we judge it? You see how flawed this thinking is. It, it, Romans 3.20. Let's look at this one. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in a sight. Basically, by your obedience, nobody's going to be saved by their obedience. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. God gave the law to us for two reasons. The first one, so we would follow it. Because God always, the, creation, the creator always knows what's best for creation. First reason he gave, gave us the law, so we would follow it. The second reason, I'll show you. Here, Ex- let's go to Exodus 3.20, or 20, verse 3. The second reason he gave us is the law, to show us we can't keep it. This is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You may say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not in another religion. I'm not worshiping a, a golden calf. Well, the reality is your God could be money, could be success. It could be the approval of men, could be anything. We don't even need to talk about the rest of the Ten Commandments. We can't even keep the first one. And and here's, here's, I think this is good news. It's exhausting trying to earn something. I mean, trying to earn the approval of a God makes you ride your bike in the rain at night. Makes you walk along the side of the road where where it's dangerous at night. This is good news. The fact that we can't earn God's love is not is not a bad thing. That is good news. The good news is Jesus knew that, came to earth, and took the punishment we deserve. That is good news. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, popular pastor, said, to make it quite practical, I have a very simple test. After I've explained the way of Christ, after I've explained the gospel to somebody, I ask them, now, are you ready to say you're a Christian? And they often hesitate. And then I say, what's the matter? Why are you hesitating? And so often people say, I don't feel like I'm good enough yet. I don't think I'm ready to say I'm a Christian now. And Lloyd-Jones said, it sounds modest to say that, that, well, I don't think I'm good enough. But when you're saying that, it's a very denial of the faith. The very essence of the Christian faith is to say, Jesus is good enough, and I am good enough in him. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Three things we realize when we understand the importance of the gospel. The first one is we're not saved by good morals. The second one is our perspective changes. Let's read verse 5 through 7. It says, He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Cephas is Peter, then to the other twelve disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, Jesus did after he was raised from the dead. I love that line. It's like Paul saying, hey, if you don't believe me that Jesus was raised from the dead, there are 500 people that saw him 
and most of them are still alive. If you don't believe me, go ask them. They're still here. Go ask them. And, and you know, I, like I said, I've been reading these verses for probably the last three months. And this never stood out to me until I was listening to a pastor's sermon on this text um, this past week. He appeared to Cephas, who is Peter. Do you realize what that means? Peter was the one to deny him in front of everybody else. And Jesus goes to see Peter. He goes to see the other 12 disciples who were in hiding, afraid for their lives. That's our Savior. He goes to see his brother, half-brother James, who, who didn't believe in him at first. That, that's our Savior. These, these guys, they abandoned Jesus. Yet in his love and compassion, that's who Jesus goes to see. That's our Savior. I don't need to know your past. I know who Jesus is. You know, this world is temporary. This is, this is not our home. Christmas is a fun season. Me, me and my wife were talking about that this week. It's like, man, it's just, there's something, it just seems special. There's just something that when you see the tree up, you see the decorations, you see the lights, it, it just makes you feel good. But the problem is, is that it doesn't last throughout the year. December 26th is, can be kind of depressing, or when you take the lights down, you take everything down, it, it can be kind of depressing. And, you know, I thought of this. It's like, I'm all for giving gifts. I mean, it's a good thing. Well, I don't see why not. But do you realize that every, every gift that you're going to give this year, every gift you're going to receive, is going to one day be in a, in a landfill, or you're going to sell it for five bucks on a yard sale? <laughs> and I'm going to buy it and sell it for 40 This, this is the reality of the world we live in. As great as Christmas is, our joy can't be found in Christmas. It's got to be found in Jesus. Think about this. I mean, Peter went from being scared for his life, and all the disciples were, scared from their lives to be willing to give their lives for Jesus. What changed? Their perspective. Their, they had the Holy Spirit. Their heart changed. And here's the reality, and I'm glad you know, Ryan kind of mentioned it in his prayer. The reality is this is not going to be a good Christmas for everybody. It could be, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in La La Land up here. It could be your first Christmas without uh, a husband or a wife, first Christmas without a son or a daughter, first Christmas without a parent, grandparent. That, that's the reality of the world we're in. But you know, here, here's what I was thinking about. Jesus' birth is not the end of the story. It, he goes on, he, you know, he dies for us. He raises three days later. And because of that, we can trust, we can always trust God has our best intentions in mind because of what he did on the cross. You know, we can have hope that this isn't our home. This is only temporary. And we, we can get to the point where we realize, you know, God, I don't know what the plan is. I, you know, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm not going to give up on you, and I'm going to trust you because I can look to the cross and know that you love me. You know, there's a day coming when sin's not going to reign over this world. God's going to make everything right. Don't give up. Keep going. Look to Jesus. Hebrews said Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. We fix our eyes on him, and when we can do that, we can have a perspective that says, Despite the circumstances, I can have joy in Christ because I know he is in charge and he loves me. Third, that's my third point. First two, what happens when we understand the importance of the gospel? We realize we're not saved because of good morals. The second thing is our perspective changes. And the third thing is we find joy in Christ. I used to think joy in Christ was, was some level to be attained. Like it was something I would get when I grew um, as a Christian, you know, 10 years from now. But, but then I heard a pastor say it, and I don't, I don't really, really even remember what he said, but it, it just kind of came to me that, you know, my joy in Christ is realizing today, you know, what God did for me. I can have joy in Christ because I can have joy of what he did. He came to this earth, died on the cross, and save me from my sin. That is what joy in Christ is. And let's listen closely to what Paul says right here. It's in verse 8 through 11. Listen how Paul talks about himself. 
Last of all, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, whoever preached the gospel, so we preach, and so you believed. Why was God's grace towards Paul not in vain? Because Paul became an excellent worker for the sake of the gospel. And, you know, I, I like John Piper said, God's grace does not hinder our effort. It does not replace our effort. It empowers our effort. We don't serve God to earn his love. We serve God because he loved us first. Romans says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like Paul says, I am what I am. Paul's saying, I'm the least of the apostles, but by his grace, I am what I am. You know, you know what Paul, why he can say that confidently is because his joy is in Christ. It's not in his circumstances. Paul, Paul's in, uh, Paul spent time in prison. He was all over the place. He was persecuted. Yet all of it, he had joy in Christ because, again, his joy was not in his circumstances. It was in what Christ had done for him and how he had changed his life. He's content where he's at because of his joy in Jesus. And that's why nothing could shake Paul. Paul would have been a crazy guy to try to stop. Like, nothing could shake him. I want to close with this. Let's go back to verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Man, if there's anything we can get from these verses, it's this. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins, and he, was, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. That is what's most important. Jesus is what's most important. What does that look like practically uh, for us here at Freedom? You know, I think... It's possible, especially if you've been here a while. Maybe you've been here years, many years, or uh, a decade, or decades, possibly. I think it's possible that we can get distracted and think that because we don't have a building that we meet on every Sunday, um, you know, that, 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 that fulfills all of our needs, we can see that as the touchdown. We can see our win is if we get a building. Listen, I, I'm all for us. I'm the guy that when I think there may be a building that's a good fit, I go in parking lot and pray that they're going to give us the building for free. <laughs> but here's the reality. You know what happens if we get a building? We're going to preach the gospel and make disciples. The, the exact same thing we're already doing. You see, all, all of those things, you know, Building, ministries, programs, they're all important. They all help us share the gospel and make disciples, but they're not the most important thing. The gospel, Jesus, it's, there's nobody in here that's graduated beyond the gospel. It's the gospel that saves us. It's the gospel that transforms us. It's the gospel that sustains us. It's the gospel that gives us hope. You know what I mean? I'm all for saying Merry Christmas, but who cares? Merry Christmas, happy holidays. Nobody is getting saved because we say Merry Christmas. They're getting saved because their ears are opened and their eyes are opened to who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is absolutely the reason for the season, but he's also the reason for December 26th, December 27th, December 28th, and for the rest of the year. He's the reason we could get up in the morning. He's the reason for all existence. This could be your first time in church ever today. And you're, you're, you could be, um, you know, I've, I've had friends and, and family would be like, so you're telling me being a good person does not make me a Christian? That idea could, be, could absolutely blow your mind today. Here's what I'll tell you. God is not here to hold us, hold us down. God is here to set us free, free from sin, free from the approval of man, free from the things that are literally destroying us. I've got, again, I've got an eight-month-old. 
<laughs> and this morning, trying to dress him, he was screaming and going crazy. He's going through a phase right now where he does not want to be dressed at all. And to try to change him or doing anything, he goes crazy. And, like, that's us, isn't it? Like, if he would just sit still and let me do it, it would take, like, one minute. But he's kicking, screaming, and isn't that us? It's like we question God as, you know, like, you know, where were we when, when the world was formed? Nowhere. You know, we question God like that. We're kicking, screaming. And let me, but let me tell you this. My son has nothing to offer me right now. He can't, he can't pay our bills. He can't feed himself. He can't change himself. But I still love him because he's my son right now. Let me show you this verse. John, John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is of first importance, that Christ was crucified and raised on the third day. Because of that, we, can be, we don't have to be perfect. We can trust him. We can trust what Jesus did for us. We can have hope. We can have joy in the midst of any circumstance. Christmas is a joyful season. But it ends. But in Christ, we can have joy for the rest of our lives and the rest of eternity. What is most important? Simple, Jesus. You pray with me. God, we, we, we thank you. For coming here and saving us. It, it really is a, a simple gospel. And, you know, we, we're not perfect and we, we don't have it all together. But for some reason, uh, in your mercy and in your love, you saved us. God, I just ask that, you know, for everybody here in this room, that you would help us understand you're just not the most important thing during Christmas time. You're the most important thing the rest of the year and the rest of our lives. You're absolutely the reason for the season, but you're the reason for so much more. God, we, we can't do this without you. Help us keep our eyes on you, not on, not on our circumstances, not on us, but on you. I just I, I pray for everybody here that uh, you would help us understand that this Christmas season, that you would give us courage. You would, you would make us bold uh, to share the gospel with family members that are around us that, that may identify as a Christian, but their heart they're not. God, help us, uh, give us the discernment to recognize whether somebody is a Christian or not a Christian. Give us the boldness to share your good news with us. And man, it is good news. God, in all these things, uh, we thank you and we praise you. You're, it's all for your glory. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen.
worship in your life Cause your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful Good, that song went right with the sermon. 
if you're visiting with us here for the first time um, and you want to talk to somebody about being a Christian, you'd like that explained to you even more, God, you feel like God spoke to your heart, please fill out one of the cards and put that in the offering box on the way out and we'll get with you as soon as we can. Um, it's going to be a men's breakfast January 5th at 7.30 out at our Sable Street property. Love to have fellowship with you. Come eat breakfast, 7.30. Please sign up so we know how much food we need to make for that day. Um, we found a brown study Bible. It's a real nice study Bible. It's got notes in it. Somebody's been listening to the sermon, taking notes. So we like that. But it's out there at the table. So if that's your Bible, go and get that. Um, I want to say thank you to Michael Fear for him speaking for me today. I got a little overwhelmed because I got to do a sermon tomorrow night with that big crowd of Christmas Christians, you know? So, so I got all nervous. So I asked Michael to speak, and now I know it had nothing to do with me. It was all about God wanting us to hear that message. It was very good. Um, so I said last week it's 6.30, so it's 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Frank, don't mess that up. You, you come at 6.30, you're going to be there while we're holding candles, okay? It's a short and sweet service. We sing Christmas carols. They're, they're going to sing their famous hallelujah song. Uh, you all know our guys do it better than the people that do it professionally, but we get no money because it's copyrighted, but it's good. It's just our blessing. So come, hear that song. I got a message on my heart. I'm going to be nice. But I'm going to let, I get them once a year, I'm going to let them know <laughs> that, that Jesus is no longer a baby. And, 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 and he is coming back. And we are a lot closer to the second return than we are his first coming, right? So we need to get ready. So I hope you come tomorrow night and celebrate with us. It's going to be a great night of fun. Come sit up front. Sit up front. I, if I wasn't a pastor, I'd sit in the back. But I'm asking you, sit up front. Uh, make room for the visitors, okay? Six o'clock tomorrow. God bless you. See you next time.